You have been taught the basics of the Umbra, enough to make do for now at least, but that is only half of what one must know to survive in the Velvet Shadows. For why the very environment itself can often pose a great danger to the Garou who wish to traverse it, it would be infinitely much safer and less interesting were it not for its denizens, the spirits that reside within it. To understand spirits, we must understand the world as the Garou do. To them, and the other changing breeds, the world is animistic in nature. That means that everything around us, from the lowliest plants to the tallest mountains, and even electronics or buildings, may be in possession of a spirit. Like I mentioned in the previous lesson, not everything has a spirit, especially not newly crafted things, but older places and objects, especially those who hold a deep significance or importance, may have a spirit tied to it. The human faith of Shintoism, for example, is one that similarly shares this view on the world. Spirits are discorporate, that is to say they have no physical body and can only naturally be found in the Umbra. The most common form of spirits are those residing in the Penumbra, that representing several aspects of nature, such as animals, plants and the elements. Some mortals are more attuned with the spiritual realm and can thus, in a way, sense their presence while others, deadened by their exposure to the distractions of society and technology, do not. Some places are more spiritual than others, and those will often have a thin gauntlet, allowing for easier traversal for the Guru, and for spirits to more effectively influence the real world. The Umbra is to a spirit like the ocean is to a fish. You can travel anywhere, few things, if any, last, and even those that do rarely do so forever. The stagnant, logical, and prison-like world humanity inhabits is as alien to them as the ground we walk on would be for a fish. For Garou born and raised amongst humans, it takes great effort to understand the Umbra, and in turn to understand the spirits who reside in there, their mindset, and their perception on reality. Yet it is crucial, for without the spirits there would be no gifts, no fetishes, and possibly even no cairns. Spirits are more plentiful than one might first notice. A vast majority of them slumber, composing the inert spiritual matter of the Umbra, yet a skilled Thurg, or a great change in their environment, may be able to rouse them. And when they slumber, these spirits join with Gaia's great consciousness, and they will regain strength from this, awakening later reinvigorated. Yet as Gaia grows weaker, so too does Gnosis, from which awakened spirits feed, and thus fewer and fewer ever rise from their deep slumber, bringing stagnation and death even to the Velvet Shadow. One reason that spirits are attracted to the Guru is their Gnosis. If they offer this Gnosis up to the spirits, they may in turn ask for their help or services, and through this mutual agreement they may both thrive. Yet some would rather enslave these spirits, forcing them to do their biddings, and while this works, Pity the Guru whose clave breaks and the spirit of war trapped inside hungers for revenge. Just like how we will wither away without a connection to the spiritual realm, so too do the spirits require a bond to the physical realm to sustain themselves. There are many different forms of Gnosis, not just from werewolves, although this is an often safer and stronger source of it, but ranging from worm tainted energies to the wild and untamed power of the Wild. Despite its seemingly chaotic nature, the spiritual world is highly structured and hierarchical. We have spoken at length about Gaia, who is first and most powerful of all spirits, followed close by the Triad, the Wild, the Weaver and the Weir. But beneath them are the Celestines, who can at best be described as gods. Some of them are well known to the Guru, Luna and Helios, the Moon and Sun for example, are spirits that can actually be met and converse with. But that, of course, is rare and a great honor. There are other Celestines, and what ties them all together is that they are powerful enough to create their own realms within the Umbra, where they are the ultimate authority. They are godlike in nature, and it is said that Gaia also manifests as a Celestine sometimes, but some Guru believe that she is not the true reflection of Gaia, but rather just of the planet Earth, although that makes her only marginally less important in the eyes of the werewolves. 
the Celestines are capable of manifesting avatars of themselves, and they often do this to communicate with lesser beings, as they, in their true shapes, would be nigh comprehensible to mortals. And even these avatars, representing only a fraction of their real power, are still some of the most potent spirits that can be encountered in the Umbra. Luna holds a special place of importance to the Garu, not only because of her chosen metal silver, which is a bane to their kind, dangerous even to touch, but it is also thanks to her that they are able to travel between cairns through so-called moon bridges, crossing moon paths through the Umbra. And let us not forget the importance of the moon signs, the defining traits of the members of a pack. Indeed, Luna is often an object of worship by the Garu, who sometimes raise her up to be Gaia's sister, even theorizing that the Garu are themselves children of Luna just as much as children of Gaia, set by the Moon Sister to defend creation. Beneath the Celestines are the Incarnate, and these are the spirits who most often meet with and communicate with the Celestines. These are also the strongest spirits that Garu tend to interact with on a regular basis, and they are the ones who most often serve in the capacity of totems to sects, tribes, or even packs. Naturally, Owl herself will not become a totem for a lowly pack of fresh-faced Garu, but she will create an avatar of herself that will help guide these young warriors on their journey. Incarnate rarely if ever have their own domains in the Umbra, instead residing in those of their master Celestines. With exceptions, of course, and some Incarnate are so powerful they might aspire to one day become a Celestine themselves. The Incarnate, in their purest form, rarely bother with any but the most exceptional pharaoh who wish to interact with them, and while some may be patrons to specific tribes or septs, it is a rare thing that they would not extend their patronage to individual packs who show them the proper respect and tribute. Beneath the Incarnate are the Jaglings, who in turn are served by Gaflings. Gaflings are little more than automata, spirits of very low power with equally low awareness of their surroundings and thought patterns. They can be compared to simple creatures like insects or the leaves on a tree. Jaglings, however, often operate at least semi-autonomously, and therefore have enough intelligence and presence of mind to communicate with other spirits and any guru, other pharah, or even mage they may come across. The jaglings serve incarnate as part of their brood, as do the gaflings indirectly, but gaflings generally tend to have a closer bond with their jaggling masters than the incarnate, who is often far beyond the scope of their understanding. Jagglings are usually the spirits that Garu turn to to learn new gifts. Gifts and mythical powers of the Garu can technically be taught between werewolves, and some easier ones may be shared, but certain other gifts may simply be too dangerous to teach another Garu, as it will require some training before it fits, unlike with the spirit, or it might even insult the spirit from whom it was learned in the first place. Spirits rarely ask for much in payment for teaching a Garu a gift. Generally, veneration and respect are all they ask for, as their imparted wisdom will earn the Garu renown, which in turn will reflect well upon themselves. Some spirits will demand strange or seemingly arbitrary favors in return, but these often have a deeper meaning to it, visible only to the Garu once the lesson is properly imparted. Over time, a Garu may even earn themselves quite a few spiritual mentors, and their relationships may come to grow and develop over time until they are almost like family. Most spirits also have some manner of material correspondence to them, something in the physical realm that they value or are even bound to. A raging inferno, for an inferno spirit, or perhaps a certain piece of clothing or jewelry that a particular ancestor spirit treasured dearly in life a bowl of blood for a bloodthirsty warrior, or a long and strenuous duel between two Garu to show their dedication. If these correspondences are invoked, the spirit will usually be more positively inclined towards the Garu, and more welcome to the idea of forming a pact with them. A spirit's true name holds great power over them, and thus it is exceedingly rare for any to learn it. A Garu who is taught a spirit's true name therefore has been granted one of the highest honors the spirit can bestow upon them, and should therefore show the appropriate appreciation of this honor. 
We mentioned earlier ancestor spirits, and those do exist, the most prominent ones being legendary heroes of tribes who lived gloriously in times past, and whose memories are still honored to this day. The Guru are split on their exact nature, some meaning that they are the very same Guru who once lived, elevated perhaps by their totem to a state of honor, while others hold that it is instead the very memory of the ancestor that has coalesced into a spirit, that it is a reflection of who they once were, a living memory created from a spirit who has taken its shape. Through Chiminage, Garu and other pharaoh can form pacts with spirits, exchanging favors and alliances. This is, of course, not a one-way street. Spirits often have very specific things they require from the Guru, who swears them allegiance, and if these are not fulfilled, the spirit may break their pact, or even grow hostile, laying a curse upon the other party. Thus, most Guru will go through a Thurg when they seek to bargain with the spirits, the Crescent Moon's well versed in dealing with the spirit realm. In a sense, a personal pact is like a marriage, where both partners have needs and wants, and if they cannot coexist, it is doomed to failure and misery. Pact totems are rarely the most powerful spirits a guru interact with. They are brood of the incarnate, but are more likely powerful jagglings or even an avatar of the incarnate itself. The forming of a pact and the pact with the spirit is a life-changing event which deeply strengthens the bond between the guru of the pact, both between each other and with their new spirit guide. As time goes by and the pack grows in power, so too may the totem, as it forms a kind of synergy with its wards. Other spirits may be asked to reside in cairns, protecting these sacred places and gaining nourishment from its gnosis-rich environment, and each tribe have an incarnate spirit as their totem, ranging from Unicorn, the patron of Children of Gaia, to Grandfather Thunder, the totem of the Shadow Lords. Finally, a spirit may be coaxed to reside within an item, turning it into what is called a fetish, a powerful tool in the hands of a guru who may wield it against their foes. Fetishes often require some manner of sacrifice to be employed properly, the spirit inside fed by the user's gnosis as they are somewhat cut off from their natural source of the stuff. Some fetishes are extremely old, passed down through generations, the spirits inside equally powerful. Grand claves are such items, and they are often home to more than just one spirit. These fetishes are extremely rare and powerful, objects of worship and veneration amongst the Guru, and to inherit one of these treasures is to carry a great burden of expectations upon one's shoulders. Their numbers are five, and they are dark gods. Snow, an insightful yet compassionate master. Bambi Parsons, whose passion inspires and leads by example. Dr. Sheepington, a sage and venerable keeper of ancient wisdom. The unemployed writer, whose words have guided nations throughout the aeons. And Dugal, the ancient and terrifying who stalks the night. These are our masters, and to worship them is to attain salvation. Their childer, the Methuselah, sit like kings and queens above us. Their wills ours to obey. They are Her Satanic Majesty Danny, reborn through fire and ice, Maximilian S. Hardcastle, a master of our ancient jihad, Socrates Johnson, a scholar and mentor, the ambitious and loyal Laura Neeson, the enigmatic yet influential Procyon, as well as Alexander Kanehurst of the dreaded Vilebloods. On the Council of the Primogen are seated Edward Reed, Colin Gifford, 06, Stonewolf 18, Jokerman, Ian Nichols, The Black Friar, Raven Fang, Brad Hardwick, and Pilgrim, wise leaders and of good judgment. This week the Council would wish to thank especially the Elder Joseph Perry for his support. Our gratitude truly knows no bounds. We would also wish to honor the Ancile Anvihon. Thank you once again, my friend, it means a lot. Naturally, all our elders, and Sile and neonates, receive our gratitude from the bottom of our hearts. Without your support, this would not be possible. And thank you for watching. When will you rage?